morning, everybody. Hey, good morning. Thanks for being here today. Good morning, everyone joining us online as well. I'm glad that you can join us in this way today. It's great to be with you. My name is Tim, if we've never met before, and I'm one of the pastors here at Faith Community Church. Uh, before we get started today, uh, just a reminder that yesterday was Veterans Day. So we just want to give a shout out to all of our veterans who served here at Faith Community Church. Let's give them a hand quick. Thank you guys for everything that you have done. And uh, also, uh, I had to do a longer announcement in the 9 o'clock about this, but I just want to let you know, those of you at the 11 o'clock service, some of you are here because you knew we were getting tight in the 9 o'clock, so you, uh, you know, your lives were flexible enough that you could make a move here. And I just want to say thank you to you for doing that. You may be wondering, does that matter? Does it make a difference? It really is making a, a big difference. The 9 o'clock is, is really, really tight. We can't find parking. We can't find uh, room for people to sit and things like that. So if you're one of those families that made a move to help us free up space in the 9 o'clock, we just want to let you know that it really matters and we really, really appreciate that. Okay, so just a word of thanks uh, for that. We're going to start a little differently this morning with a story, okay? Is everyone excited for a story with Pastor Tim? Okay, here we go. Well, before I was a pastor here at Faith Community Church, my wife Darcy and I served with a campus ministry over at UW River Falls called InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And one of the things that we did uh, every February was host something called Campus Mission Week. Campus Mission Week was a, a week of more intentional, more public, kind of more stretching evangelistic effort. We'd have focused prayer meetings in preparation for months and months in advance, and we'd have staff colleagues fly in from all over the Midwest to help us. And during the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we would host uh, these Q&A sessions in all the dormitories. Uh, students would invite their friends to come and ask a pastor any question uh, that they wanted to know about God, faith, the meaning of life, spirituality, whatever they wanted. Uh, and then in the student center, Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, we would have these interactive art displays set up uh, so students could just spark spiritual conversations as their friends were going to lunch or something like that. But the culmination of Campus Mission Week was always Thursday night. Thursday night was our, our uh, big, uh, large group gathering. We'd have a special band uh, come in. We would have a special speaker come in from out of state. And there'd always be an invitation for students to respond to the gospel. And so uh, one year, in preparation for Campus Mission Week, we had all of our student leaders read a book about prayer called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire by Jim Cimbala. It's a, it's a great book if you're looking for a, you know, a shot in the arm. Uh, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire is just a, a really, really excellent read. We also, and I don't know how this happened exactly, but we kind of unofficially made Isaiah 64 for our uh, point of focused prayer. And Isaiah 64 verses 3 and 4 go like this. When you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains shook in your presence. Since ancient times, no one has heard nor ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God like you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. This is uh, an awesome uh, scripture for focused prayer for months and months ahead of time. And the mantra kind of became, Let's ask God to do something here this year that he's never done before. Let's ask God to do something uh, in this campus mission week that he's never, ever done before. So as we gathered for our kickoff to campus mission week that year, students were jazzed, months of preparation were coming together, everything was ready to go, and then it started to snow. And then it snowed. And then it snowed and it snowed and it snowed. We called our staff colleagues from out of town. We said, you better get here quick because they're going to close down the airport in Minneapolis. And they did. The interactive stations went well. The Q&A sessions were a hit. But by Wednesday, professors were beginning to cancel classes because they couldn't get out of their driveways. Uh, the local schools were closed. It was getting hard to walk around campus. Nothing to worry about, I was assured. In 130 years, the university had never, ever closed campus because of weather. I was there on 9-11. They gave us a half day off for that. I w my junior year, a tornado busted out every window on the south side of my dorm and flooded the library basement. The professors didn't even blink. 
You go to school. So nothing to worry about. On Thursday morning, the day of the big event, we woke to the unthinkable news. The University of Wisconsin at River Falls was closed completely. Everything shut down. All classes canceled. All athletic events canceled. All practices, clubs, and meetings canceled. All buildings closed. Food service would be available on a limited basis, but those little brushy things that sweep the sidewalks could not get through the four and five foot drifts. Even the hockey game was canceled that night, and if you know anything about River Falls, that's as close to sacrilege as it gets. <laughs> Two moments from that day stand out to me. The first was a gathering of our student leadership team in a dorm basement that afternoon. We managed to trudge through the drifts, we got together, and the question, of course, was what should we do? Should we cancel the event? And my recollection is that it just wasn't even a discussion. Of course we're not going to cancel the event. That would be crazy. We've asked God to do something that's never been done before, and he did it. This isn't what we had in mind, but, but he did something that's never been done before. <laughs> so Sam, our worship leader, who happened to be here this morning, Sam was playing the guitar right over here this morning. Sam McCutcheon, our worship leader, agreed to drag his guitar through the snow that evening, and our drummer brought two Fleet Farm buckets, one to sit on and one to slap. That would be our awesome band that night. We had no sound system, so we'd just have to sing extra loud, and the speaker would have to project extra hard. The real problem, though, is we had no way to project words onto the screen that night. We had invited all these people that don't know our songs and we didn't want them to feel lost. So the other moment that stands out to me is, is about seven or eight minutes before we're supposed to open the doors and we have no projector. So I'm I remember standing in the front of North Hall Auditorium, probably seven, eight, nine liters, and someone said, well, why don't we pray about it? So that's what we did. We all bowed our heads, and I, re I just remember this like it was yesterday. Someone said, God, we really need a projector. Could you send one? And I, I mean, we opened our eyes, and here comes Isaac walking down the aisle with a projector in his hands. And we just cheered, and we laughed, and we went crazy. I have no idea where he got it from to this day. It's kind of a don't ask, don't tell kind of thing, but... <laughs> oh, I remember. Then our, our drummer with the bucket said, everybody back up. We said, why? I'm going to pray for a drum set now. <laughs> Got to be there. As it happened, students that evening turned out in droves. It had never been so easy to make invitations. Would you like to spend another evening stuck inside, or would you like to see my friend Spencer slap a bucket and hear about Jesus? Turns out that students will do almost anything not to be bored, and we were literally the only thing happening in River Falls that night. The room was more full that evening than at any meeting I had been to before or since. And not only that, there was just a, a, an unexplainable sweet spirit in the room. You know how it is when you're 19 and you have a snow day that's never happened before in the history of the world and you're breaking the rules and sticking it to the man, you know. <laughs> There was no sound system, we just, we just sang really loud and students couldn't hear the speakers, so they had to lean in really carefully and a lot of students responded. I just, it's one of those things you wish you could just bottle that night up and take it with you. No ear has heard or eye has seen any God like you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. All right, you're not gonna hear me say this often, but today we're actually not going to exposit through a specific passage of scripture the way that we normally do. We're going we're gonna to go to the book of Acts together and I want to show you a pattern that we see not just in the book of Acts but throughout scripture uh, of prayer and revival and that's what we're going to be teaching about this morning. So let's open our Bibles today to Acts chapters 3 and 4. You'll find that on page 912, 910, uh, somewhere in there. Acts chapters 3 and 4 and while you're finding that, here's kind of what we're jumping into the middle of today. The church is very young at this point, maybe a few weeks old, at most a few months old. Chapter 2 says that the Lord was adding to their number day by day. And in chapter 3, there's this really beautiful story of Peter and John healing a crippled man uh, at a gate outside of the temple. Someone who'd been crippled since birth and everyone kind of knew him because he begged there every day. 
And so this huge crowd of people gathers in the temple and they're astonished at what's happened. And so Peter, of course, gets up and proclaims the good news of the atoning death of Jesus and his resurrection. The response of the authorities is to arrest Peter and John and put them in jail overnight. And then the next day they bring Peter and John in for questioning and they threaten them uh, with punishment if they won't stop talking about Jesus. And you can imagine how that went. Uh, but their threats are not idle threats. These are the same people who orchestrated Jesus' death just months before. So what we're going to read today is the paragraph that follows that. This is chapter 4, verses 23 through 33, and here's how they responded. Acts 4, 23. When Peter and John were released... They went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why do the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city... There were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul and not one said that any of the things that belonged to him were his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this is the pattern. We see it in Acts and we see it from Judges through First and Second Kings and Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther. First, there's a crisis of some kind. Then an extraordinary uh, seeking of God in prayer. And then some kind of shaking. Today I'm going to use the word visitation. We'll explain that in a minute. And finally, there's a transformation of God's people that's so complete that they move into the world like lightning. Uh, they move into the world with such newness of life that families and cities and even nations are changed. So let's just see if we can see that in what we just read. What's the crisis in Acts chapter 4? Well, the church has just had its first run-in with the authorities. And these are not idle threats, as we've already said. And the church is afraid. Look at verse 29. They pray, God, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak with boldness. Now, you don't need to pray that unless you're struggling to be bold, unless you're struggling with fear. Second, there's an extraordinary seeking after God in prayer. Right? Verse 23 says, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priest had said. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord. And then they pray together. I love that their first instinct is to lift their voices together in prayer. And the way that Luke presents it gives the impression of extraordinary unity. Doesn't seem that there was a lot of deliberation about what to do. They knew what to do. They shared a lot of assumptions about the sovereignty of God, about the nations, about their place in the world. And then third, we see in verse 31 that there's a shaking. There's a visitation of God. We'll talk about that more in a minute. And then finally, there's a transformation. The empowering of the Spirit enables them to continue speaking the word of God with all boldness. And it says in verse 32, they were of one heart and soul. They exemplify a generous spirit and great grace, it says, was upon them all. So a crisis, a season of prayer, a visitation by God, and a transformation. You see that all through Scripture. 
So before you say to yourselves, well, of course, it's scripture. This is what God did in the Bible. Uh, before you, you say that, I just, I want to share with you a few examples from church history. Okay, I love church history, and you should love church history too. If you hate history, just hold on for 10 minutes, okay? It'll be fine. But here are just a few examples, and these really are just a few. Uh, we could do this for an hour and a half today, but just a few. 1720 to 1740. Yeah, we're going way back, okay? The crisis in 1720 is that the church in New England is as door, dead as a doornail. Many colonists who settled in New England were ardent Christian believers who came to the, to the New World hoping for a golden age of religious devotion, but it didn't last. And a new generation of their children and grandchildren arose that was very indifferent to the things of God. Uh, prosperity had kind of made their love for God cold, and then there was something called King Philip's War that just decimated Native American populations, and half the white settlements in New England were destroyed. There was a great deal of hypocrisy in the church, so this is the time of the Salem witch trials and things like that. There was great social upheaval and disillusionment, and New Englanders kind of went through an identity crisis during this time. So we think of New England in 1710 as this very religious and pious place. It, it really was not. Uh, historians tell us that as a percentage of the population, more Americans are going to church today than in 1710, to give you an idea. Uh, in 1727 then, okay, so that's the date I want you to kind of remember. 1727, a group of ministers in New England, especially Massachusetts, started organizing their people into these little groups to begin praying and asking God to pour out some kind of fresh revival uh, in their country. And the, the, the ministers themselves personally committed to daily prayer for a visitation of God in New England. At the same time, same year, on the other side of the ocean in Germany, a group there established a 24-hour-a-day prayer room that continued for 100 years. A hundred, until eight, the 1820s, this little room had someone praying for the revival of the world 24 hours a day. That following year then, 1728, in New Jersey, of all places, what, does anything good come out of New Jersey? <laughs> in New Jersey, what's, came, what's come to be known as the First Great Awakening was poured out. And for 20 years, uh, on both sides of the ocean, there was this extraordinary outpouring of God's Spirit on the church. Historians still can't quite figure out why this happened. We're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of people who previously had no interest in the things of God flocking into churches and being converted in droves. In New England, uh, people used to preaching, you know, to 50 people at a time would preach three, four, five times a week just to fit everybody in. We, they, some of them kept meticulous records. You can go to a library in Connecticut today and see lists of names uh, where we had, you had preachers seeing 20, 30 people converted every time they preached for three years, this went on. So people like to think, you know, oh, it's 1720. Of course, everybody was crazy about religion. That is not the case at all. But historians estimate by the end of the Great Awakening, 1780, 80% of Americans were in, were in church on a weekly basis. 80% from less than we see today. The impact of this was, was so remarkable that what we call the War of Independence, the British called the Presbyterian Revolt, okay? If you were Presbyterians, you would, you would have said, woo, hey, all right. But it permanently altered the American landscape. It led to a renewed effort to reconcile with Native Americans. Revival even broke out among a group of Native Americans in 1742. Jonathan Edwards wrote two of his most important, most famous books living in a Native American community. Ministers who supported the revival racially integrated their churches at a time when that, that didn't happen anywhere in the world. And some even opened their pulpits to black preachers. Now, I am not saying today that you know, the kingdom, you know, the sky just split and the kingdom of God fell down in New England and everything was perfect. But Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is like leaven in a loaf. And it works 
quietly but powerfully and inevitably. And it really does change things. Let's talk about uh, 1850. Here's another example. In 1855, the churches of London were also, also dead. A picture giant cathedrals built for 1,500 worshipers, and you have 150 scattered throughout the building. Well, that was the case at New Park Street Chapel, a, a huge Baptist church meant to hold 1,500, just a scattering of people, and they called a 19-year-old kid named Charles Spurgeon to be their preacher. He'd never even finished high school. The first thing that he did was organize his people into prayer groups to ask for a special visitation of God in their city. On his first Sunday, there were 150 people. A year later, there were 3,000, and they baptized 300 of those. They ran out of room, so they, they had to tear their old building down. They moved to a new a music hall that seated 10,000, and 10,000 showed up. So then they moved to another place that held 27,000, and who can guess how many showed up? 20, you guys are 27,000. That's the you guys are bad at the game. 27,000. <laughs> in, in in his fourth year at New Park Street Chapel, revival broke out across the whole world. A thousand he that church baptized a thousand people in that year alone, and the whole city was changed. They built orphanages, schools, houses for the poor. This is the same time the Salvation Army begins to operate on the east side of London. And then on the other side of the ocean, same year, on the other side of the ocean in New York City, the crisis there at the time was, again, the churches are dead, and the city is being torn apart by a new wave of Italian and Irish immigrants who are basically have these running street battles going throughout the city. And the issue of slavery is just tearing the country apart. So that year, 1858, six businessmen from Wall Street agreed to meet every day in their lunch hour to pray for their city and the world. The next week, 20 showed up, then 30, then 40. By the end of the year, 10,000 businessmen were meeting every, every day to pray for their city and for the world and to ask God for a special outpouring of his spirit. And it happened. It happened. This is the, this is the, the, the time period in his, if these names mean anything to you, but this is when Hudson Taylor began his great missionary effort in China. D.L. Moody started his first Sunday school class that year. Cambridge, the Cambridge Seven were called into the mission field. Historians tell us that one third, think about this, one third of Northern Ireland was converted in that year. And two million people joined churches in New England as these businessmen prayed. Now, just in case you think this is just a, a Western phenomenon, in the year 1900, less than 1% of Korean people identified as Christians, uh, most identified as Buddhist or, or by some other Eastern religion. But there was a small group of missionaries and pastors who had heard about this revival that swept through Wales and Scandinavia. And so they got together and began praying that God would have mercy and give a similar outpouring of his spirit on a nation that really had no history with Christianity at all. This went on for about a year. They prayed month after month after month and nothing happened. Finally, in 1907, during one of these prayer meetings, one of the leaders stood up and confessed that he had been embezzling money the whole time and that God had convicted of, of his sin and that he would return it the next day. Well, eyewitnesses testify that instantly Something swept through the room. And the group stayed until two o'clock in the morning confessing their sin and seeking God and the revival they had been waiting for was just poured out across the Korean Peninsula. Today the largest churches in the world are in Korea. The largest Presbyterian church in the world is in Korea, 55,000 people. The largest Methodist church is there. The largest church period is in Seoul, South Korea. 700,000 members in one church in South Korea. That's a lot. In case you, I, I tried to say in the first service that that's the size of Minneapolis. Imagine all of Minneapolis and St. Paul worshiping in one church and you have an idea of what's happening in Korea this morning, okay? And the thing about the Korean church is that they are known above all else for prayer. A, a Korean prayer meeting is a, that's a proper noun. It's a thing. 
where they gather, they still gather once a month and pray all the way through the night for God's work in their, in their country. Time wouldn't suffice to tell of the East African revival of the 1920s that went through Uganda and Rwanda, the student volunteer movement. The student volunteer movement is the largest single mobilization of, of missionaries in the history of the world. It started with a prayer meeting at William and Mary College. The Brooklyn Tabernacle, the revivals that followed the Second World War, the Jesus People movement of the 1970s. Large and small, local and global, some that go on for decades, some that only last a few years. Each one follows the pattern of a crisis, seeking God in prayer, some kind of shaking, some kind of visitation by God, and a radical transformation of both the church and the world. A month ago, I mentioned that, uh, that, that film, The Jesus Revolution. You remember me talking about that? Uh, it, it's about the, the Jesus people movement of the 1970s. And I mentioned just in passing that it came all the way to UW River Falls down the road. After that service, one of our members, Mike Brammel, approached me. He said, I was there. I was converted in 1972 at UW River Falls. I was one of the long-haired, barefoot, pot-smoking hippies that became a follower of Jesus. He's, and he told me the exact same story I've heard from a ton of people from that era. Some Iowa farmer named Dwayne came to work for the Navigators and went to all these parties and started talking to hippies about Jesus and 400 students, 10% of the campus, became followers of Jesus in those two years. And not just like sort of followers of Jesus, they're retiring from the mission field and from pastorates and from being authors now. Mike's nickname, by the way, was Drifty. So let's keep that going here at Faith Community Church if we could. That'd be good. What do I mean? So crisis, prayer, and then visitation. What, what, are, where, what do I mean by visitation and where am I getting that from? In verse 31, it says the place where they were meeting was shaken. It, it is talking about, a, I mean, literally the room was shaken, okay? But what's, what's going on there is this is an echo of the book of Exodus where God uh, came down and made his presence felt among his people and the earth was shaken. And one of the words that the Old Testament uses to describe that coming down is the word visit. It's, it's a visitation by God. It's his way of saying to these uh, disciples, I've heard you. I'm with you. I'm going to do what you asked. Now the question, of course, is, well, wait a minute. It isn't God everywhere? How can this be? God, you know, God visited them. Wasn't he already there? You know, isn't he here with us? Isn't that one of the most precious promises that we have? That when we're gathered in his name, he promises to be with us? Absolutely. But the Bible uses this word visit to talk about moments when God draws near in a unique way. He makes his presence felt in a unique way. So for example, in Genesis chapter 21, it says that the Lord visited Sarah as he had said and the Lord did for Sarah what he promised and Sarah conceived and bore a son. You see? In Psalm 65, it says you visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide grain and so you've prepared it. It goes on to describe the visitation of God just causes the earth to just bloom, just to open up with, with life where there had only been death. Psalm 80 is a psalm that God gave to his people to help us pray for revival. This is the refrain. Restore us, O God. Let your, light, let your face shine that we may be saved. And then that psalm goes on to describe Israel as a vine to say, God, we're dying here. We need your help. Would you come and visit us and make us alive to bear fruit again? In Acts chapter 3, okay, so we've been in Acts 3 and 4 this morning. In Acts chapter 3, verse 20, when Peter is preaching to the crowd, he says to them, I want you, this is, yeah, 320, I want you to repent that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. He, he has in mind this tradition of God drawing near and giving new life. Listen to Isaiah chapter 64. Okay, so have Acts chapter 4 in your mind. And listen to this from Isaiah. 
Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. The mountains would tremble before you. As when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Mountains, you know, are, they look so solid, don't they? So immovable. These authorities who threatened God's people with punishment, that these are not idle threats. They really can do the things they're threatening to do. They look so powerful. And the, so the church turns to God to say, come down and shake, shake the mountains. Do things here that we've never seen before. Here's a definition of revival that I'm borrowing from Tim Keller. It says, revival is a work of God in which the church is both beautified and empowered because the normal operations of the Holy Spirit, conviction of sin, enjoyment of grace, and access to the presence of God are intensified. Do you get that? Uh, the normal operation of the Spirit is intensified. That's all. That matters for at least three reasons. There are at least three other views on revival that I'm just going to talk about really quickly. The progressive or mainline view of revival is, well, why, why would I want that? It sounds a little fundamentalist. All this talk of sin and repentance feels a little regressive. Uh, I don't think we even need that. The, the second view of revival, I'm going to call the marketing view. Maybe you grew up in a tradition like this. I haven't seen this in a long time, but I used to when I was a kid. Every so often you'll uh, drive by a church sign that says, Revival, Sunday night, 7.30 to 9.30, Dr. So-and-so speaking. I don't think that's a very good way to use the word. I, I think Jonathan Edwards and Spurgeon, there said, you know, they, they would not endorse that understanding. How can you decide to just have something that only comes from God, especially on Sunday from 7.30 to 9.30? Uh, now, that's not common anymore. I haven't seen a sign like that in ages. But it is really common uh, to think that all we need to make this happen is better marketing. If we want revival, uh, we can orchestrate it. If we just get a good speaker and a really cool band or something like that, uh, we can make this happen. But the thing is, uh, this doesn't mean, by the way, th this does not mean that we shouldn't market, okay? Uh, we ha we ne really need a new sign out by the road. Ours looks like it's been hit by 10,000 mowers and it just, needs, it just needs to change. I'm not saying you can't have a good website. I'm not saying you can't have excellent music that you shouldn't have a good speaker. I'm not, you know, there's nothing wrong with bringing in a special like a Tony Dungy or something like that. I just think, oh, that's awesome. I'm just saying revival is not something that that produce, that's produced by that. The most recent genuine revival I'm aware of was down at Asbury College last year. And to my knowledge, I've never heard of a single leader from that movement being at a conference speaking about how you should do it. Because they have no idea. Okay? Uh, I've, I've seen some of the video uh, from the day that that happened. They weren't doing anything extraordinary. Kind of whole hum, if I'm totally honest. Just kind of blah, blah, blah. And wham! God gave what only God can give. There's a third view of revival. I'll call it the charismatic view, and that, that view says that the essential marks of a revival are extraordinary actions of the Holy Spirit. So in other words, we don't have revival until there's healing and words from the Lord and miracles are happening. Then we have revival. Now the problem is that biblically and historically that just won't stick. We've said revival is a work of God in which the church is beautified and empowered because the normal operations of the Spirit, confession of sin and experience of God's grace and access to God are intensified. And sometimes that will come with healing and other extraordinary things, but not always. George Whitfield, one of the most famous preachers of the first Great Awakening, literally seeing 10, 20, 30, 40, 100 people converted every single day, 
Uh, he, Benjamin Franklin was actually a, an admirer of George Whitfield. He published his sermons. He did not, he was never converted. He did not agree with what Whitfield taught. But he said, I can't argue with the results either. He noted how when, when Whitfield left the city, incidents of drunkenness and vagrancy plummeted, not for a week, not for a month, but for years afterward. Fathers would return to their families. Uh, women and children were taken care of. Fields that had been left fallow were cultivated again. Just everything would bloom after Whitfield left for a long time. Well, there was this little prayer group called the, uh, the Fetter Lane Society that wrote to Whitfield to say, hey, we love what you're doing, love you, but we don't think that the power of God has really come down on you because there are no miracles. And Whitfield, in a very humble way, wrote back to say, what need is there of miracles, such as healing sick bodies and restoring sight to blind eyes, when we see greater miracles every day by the power of God's word? Don't the spiritually blind now see? Aren't the spiritually dead now raised? Are not leprous souls now cleansed? Aren't the poor having the gospel preached to them? If we have the thing already which such miracles were only intended to point to, why should we tempt God and require further signs? Do you see what he's saying? The point of miracles is to get people to the gospel. And if people are already believing the gospel in droves, why tempt God, you know? The essence of revival isn't extraordinary operation of the Spirit, but conviction of sin, and the, the joy of knowing that the cross is paid for all my sin and the presence of God becomes real to my heart, those things just get amped up, you know, to a million. So crisis, prayer, and visitation, finally, there's an impact on the world as the church is beautified and empowered and runs like lightning out into the world. Revival is not a private thing. It brings transformation to individuals, to families, to churches, to cities, and even to nations. So I think you know, people who write about this kind of thing or study this kind of thing would say, if marriages are not experiencing a fresh renewal, it isn't revival yet. If addicts aren't experiencing new freedom, if, if public justice and righteousness are not prevailing, then be careful about calling it a revival. It could be marketing. It could just be a great speaker. Tim Keller, teaching about this, said, you know, one of the scariest things about this right now is that we live in an age of big churches. And people see that as a sign of revival. He said, I doubt that very much. What we've been going through in this country the last 20 years should not be called a revival. And the reason for that is because wherever there's been a real revival, there are massive social changes, close quote. And that's not what we see right now. I have a lot, a lot, a lot of examples of that that I could share from history. I, I just, I would want to impress upon you, it's hard to appreciate the impact that these things have had on world history and that you and I are still living in many ways as the beneficiaries of an awakening 300 years ago. I need to close with this though. I'm gonna, ushers, why don't you just get ready for communion and I'll have you come share it in just a minute. One more observation about Acts chapter 4. I want you to notice that these people in this prayer meeting could not have had a bigger vision of God than they did. They say, Sovereign Lord, who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. They say everything that's transpired with Herod and Pontius Pilate and all the nations, everything that they've done, verse 28, is only what your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. They're articulating something called God's providence. We did some teaching about this last fall. It's a doctrine that we love and believe very strongly. Well, one of the concerns that people have about the doctrine of God's providence is that it would make us passive. If God really is in control of everything, well, why do anything? Why do evangelism? Why pray? But we never see that in Scripture. Never. What we see are people praying because you are sovereign God, Grant us boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and to perform signs. There's a world of difference between being passive 
and with coming to grips with the limits of human strength. Those are radically different things. There's a difference between passivity and coming to grips with the idea that they're just things we can't do. This is part of the pattern as well. It isn't just crisis. Okay, crisis is a dime a dozen. What we see in scripture is crisis that pushes the church to the end of their strength to say, we've done all that we can. And God, if you don't move now, we're lost. I wanna, I wanna invite you. How, how, let, me share, let me just share a couple of thoughts. Hey, ushers, why don't you come on up and start serving? Come on up. Faith community, I have a little love note for you here. That's right, I wrote it. See? A couple of things about you that I love. Faith Community Church is careful, faithful, very faithful people, steady and steadfast. Faith Community Church is a place full of wisdom. There, there are a lot of people here who've walked with God for a really long time. We are planners. Faith Community is led by a bunch of engineers, and we, we plan and we're intentional and orderly and under control. There's a reason I don't touch the budget at Faith Community Church, okay? And I love all these things about you. There's a, there's a natural skepticism in us toward any leaders with grandiose visions. We're nervous about pride. We uh, are nervous about people's ambition. We love the glory of God. And so if anyone attempts to steal any of that glory we get real upset there's an, a natural aversion at faith community to any kind of name it claim it anything that smacks of attempting to manipulate a holy and righteous god is just not going to make it far at faith community church and i love that uh, that that's that's what i'm like and this is the kind of church i want to be a part of I would also like to be a part of a church that is praying. God, would you do something here in our midst that you have never done before? Would you rend the heavens and come down? Because we've done all that we can now. And we need you to move. I don't some of the things I pray about, just so you know. I keep a list of members at Faith Community by my bed and I pray for you guys at night. I pray for all of your kids by name. Pray for kids by name. I ask God, would you allow that not a single kid at Faith Community Church would walk away from Christ when they graduate? I pray for marriages. This last year at Faith Community Church has just been brutal for marriages. I feel like a, a good portion of our energy is, is, I just have so many friends who are hurting in their marriages and they've been hurting for years and they feel stuck. And I'll just say it, you know, Pat talked last week about our biblical counseling ministry. We have everything in place right now that we would need to minister to people. At this point, we need God. Our marriages and our families, and the men at Faith Community Church. I just got an email this week from a student at UW River Falls uh, who asked me not to share the details of the email, but she said there are things happening on, on campus that students are hurting. They are really, really hurting in a way they weren't when I was there 20 years ago. So I love our steadiness, our steadfastness, our faithfulness. And I want to add to that together. A readiness to say, God, whatever you want to do, would you do it now, please? Would you do something here that no one would ever, ever be able to take credit for? I'm going to invite you to just pray.
I'm going to give you a couple of minutes as you prepare for communion. Would you pray for us? Pray for yourself.